in town is it's worth it. Yeah, we're we're walkers. I'm gonna go get more information, okay?
record with this little bit of time left, so just keep it straight. Anything that went over that standard 
Those men were given a bonus of $10 a ton per man, plus the $45 a day in wages. Now your second miner needs mines as that little man in the hole. He's a raised miner. Now him and his partner only work day shift. They do not work two shifts. And their job is to drive a hole from one level to the next level, normally up through an ore body or to an ore body, and as they go up, they have to carry air and water lines with them, carry ventilation with them, put in landings, put in ladders, put in the chute. That machine is loaded in his hand, weighs about 180 pounds. It's called a stoker. It takes four pieces of steel to do the seven foot hole, but it does one with air and water. Now, the company gave those two men a contract. They wanted them to advance up six and a half feet a day. At the end of two weeks, when they measured from A to B, anything that was average set over that six and a half feet, they got paid. $100 a foot bonus plus the $45 a day in wages. Sometimes they did pretty good. Now you got the third miner in these mines. Me. I went to work for Phelps Dodge Corporation two days after I graduated from Bisbee High School. And against my mother's wishes, where do you think I went? I went underground. I quickly become a miner. I worked in the cut and fill soaps, in the timber soaps. And then some hard along the line in my younger days, I got into a group of men called the Rouseabouts. Now the Rouseabout is six men. Our job was to go to anywhere and everywhere there was a wreck. By that I mean a cave in. Our job was to go in, re-timber it back up so those miners could get back in. Now this job also had another little job. Every Saturday and Sunday, my job was to sit in a boatswain's chair tied to a 30-foot cable underneath those cages, and they dropped me down to do a shaft. My job, a shaft dive. Shaft dives are like what's in an elevator, feed some pages from banging back and forth against the wall. Well, after a while, I started getting a little boogery about this job for several reasons. Number one, that seat belt on this boatswain's chair was a one-inch leather strap that came around my waist. It had slots in it, and I hooked it into a button. The other part about it is the shallowest mine I was going down was 1,600 feet deep. The deepest one was 3,700 feet. I knew that if I ever slipped, I was gone. So I wound up then getting into what is called the cross-cut miner side. Cross-cut miners built the railroads, not like this mule trail I just blocked you in on. The smallest ones that we were building were ten and a half feet across on the bottom, six and a half feet across on the top, but eight foot from that rail to that trolley line. Now there was four of us to a crew, two working day shifts, two night shifts, and we rotated. And while working at the coal shaft, the company gave us a contract also. They wanted us four men between day shift and night shift to advance ahead seven feet a day. No way. Us four men did anything and everything we could do to lay a section of rail every day. That's 15 feet. We got paid $100 a foot bonus per man over that seven feet. That meant I was making close to $800 a day plus the $45 a day and no, it was $200 a day plus my $45 in wages. And if I didn't have a problem with that motor crew, many times, every two weeks, I went home with a paycheck of $2,000 worth of bonus in my pocket plus $450 in wages. Now, do you think I saved any of that money? No. I got married twice. <laughs> that ruined me. Now then, there's one thing you need to know about all these railroads that we were building. They had to be in a 2% grade going up. So we had to get the water out. Now, this is a dry mine. The rest of the mines were very wet. Between the Dallas, the Kevin, the Cole, the Junction, and the Denny Mine, they pumped right at 15,000 gallons of water a minute away from us. So everything had to have that 2% grade, so you just got to have a water ditch and just dump that water in the pump. Do me a favor, don't forget that 2% because it's going to come up a little bit later. Now then, it always comes up how many people died in the mine. During my time of 19 and a half years underground, 
was relieved from its duty by the one you saw in the scope. This machine runs on air only. There is no water. And it'll run. And if I start drilling a hole into that wall, I can guarantee you in about 20 minutes, I will have filled this room with the white dust powder. One of us could have a sinus problem. One of us could get started in the emphysema. The miners had a name for this old machine here. They called it the Widowmaker. You run it very long, you're going to be gone. Now, this next machine right here actually is the Cadillac. Well, it's referring to the Denver Jack Leg. Weighs about 165 pounds. Now, the good thing about this machine is it does run with air, it has water in it, it's got a leg that does all of the push. When you're drilling with this machine, you can throw that throttle forward, adjust that air, and stand just like this and drill what is called a seven foot hole. Now, this machine is very fast and it's very loud. I still say, um, a lot, especially around the house. But, it uses a different piece of steel. It uses a square piece of steel, but it's got a tungsten carbide bit on it. Really doesn't dull quick, too quick. I can drill 40 to 50 holes with this bit before I knock it off and put another bit on it. Now, how fast is this machine? I can take this machine and this piece of steel and drive it all the way into that wall in five to seven minutes. Now, it's a machine. All machines have problems. Yes, it's got air and water going through it. It's got a thing that lets it do the push. Let's say me and my partner are drilling somewhere and up walks a new man and he'll say, I want to be a miner. I want you to teach me how to drill. I want you to show me where to put the holes. We tell him to have that. Well, he'd jump on this machine and throw that throttle forward. As soon as that man put his leg over that leg right there, you grab the hold of him and pull him away from it. This leg will extend eight feet. It's got over 150 pounds of air pressure in it. If it breaks loose from the ground, instantaneously it pops up this high first before it takes off. See that handle right there? That handle right there will make a bad man sing soprano in his church choir. And <laughs> gonna be calling him squeaky for about two weeks. <laughs> Come on, I'm gonna show you how we blast it.
there are two rooms over there. In the second room, you sure to see the copper diplomas that some In the center, we have our gift shop, and we don't have to charge any sales tax because we're not profit. Oh, good. Uh, the restrooms are behind this wall here. This floor is the first 40 years of the general history of the town of Israel. It's all these sweet gems and minerals, but they're done in displays, and also upstairs you will find uh, big exhibits to do with miners and mining. Okay. Okay, okay. so enjoy yourself walking around. Thank and you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to join. Yeah. yeah.
Yolo Outdoors 4x4. Please hit like and subscribe at YouTube. We have Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, most of the social medias. I don't use them all, but I'll eventually start posting. So please hit like and subscribe. Alright, bye guys. Enjoy. everything thank you he deals with the largest flying whoa the Rachel look yeah, at that how this much is, is that this is a baby this is a hornet this is the giant oh Japanese God, hornet from no Japan way. he That's said most baby. of them are this big and do not fit in the jars not only Wait, are they a sale? bee not a hornet but they can sting you over and over again wow. oh, no. they also spit venom at you that can blind yeah, yeah, you, you which is why his suit looks more like a hazmat, hazmat suit, suit instead of a beekeeping oh, suit. Oh, wow. The average hive of bees in Japan are 3,000. Wow. They come up oh out of the ground at people. That's they crazy. Big ass, tall wasps out of the I ground. I would never even go for honey by the head. This is not a honeybee. This is a hornet. In fact, oh, honey, these okay. guys hunt bees and kill them for their honey. I would just stay away from There's everything. There's two very interesting YouTubes on these guys. Oh, one is a YouTube because they always send the scout, then they bring back their buddies, right? Mm -hmm. One YouTube shows 30 of these guys taking out a hive of over 30,000 honeybees. They're like a praying mantis. They bite them and grab them with their front legs. They eviscerate the bees and steal their honey. Wow. The other video is shows where the scout is checking them out, but it's a hive of wild Africanized bees, and they lure that scout right inside their area. Then they all jump on him and flap their wings, and when they get off of him, they've roasted him to death, and he can't go back and tell where they're at. Wow. The wild bees are a little more hip to the wild things out there. Isn't that cool? I thought that was in the area. Oh, that's crazy. I'm, I get scared when I hear a bee have a big carpenter bee flying around. I cannot even imagine my wildest bee flying around in Jurassic Park thunder wings or some crazy thing, you know? Really cool. So <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was You're really interesting. You, guys. Have fun. you too. Thank you.
for two more. You guys like me to take it? Yeah. Okay.
Yeah, we're great. Thank you. No. You've got one built in there. Lobby at the Inner Castle Rock. 
but at the time it was the only reliable water source in the southern New Mountains. <coughs> and those army scouts were chasing Apache horse thieves. So they figured if there were big horses through this area, they pretty much had to stop at that spring. So they sat and waited for them. They never found any horses or Apache. But they did happen to notice interesting mineral deposits, and that prompted them to file those mining claims. And those claims prompted others to file mining claims. And the majority of those claims turned out to be very, very successful. Unfortunately for the Army Scouts, there were better scouts than they were prospectors. None of them ended up making a fortune off of their claims. Have any of you taken the Queen Mine tour yet? Yes. yes. A few of you. So you've heard some of these numbers before. Though. During the over 100 years of active mining here in Bisbee, they pulled almost 8 billion pounds of copper out of the ground. Over 102 million ounces of silver and nearly 4 million ounces of gold, as well as 111 other minerals, nine of which were identified for the first time ever here in Bisbee. This was one of the largest mineral production areas in North America. Once those merchants, excuse me, once the miners started pulling minerals out of the ground, they were followed shortly thereafter by merchants, gamblers, and ladies of the evening. Now, all three were considered legitimate professions in Western mining towns. Admittedly, some were considered more honorable than others. After all, it's not a bad idea to keep an eye on those merchants. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the city grew very rapidly. By the early 20th century, late teens, early 20s, the estimated population in Bisbee was somewhere between 28 and 30,000 people, making it one of the largest cities between St. Louis and San Francisco. I say estimated population because at the time the official census was somewhere around 20,000, but they only counted members of households headed by adult white males. No single women or their families, no people of color or their families were counted, and we know there were plenty of both in old Bisbee the estimate of 28 to 30,000, which we feel is closer to reality. There weren't many children in early business. There wasn't much law enforcement. It was still the Wild West. There wasn't much to do after you got off work other than, well, drink, gamble, or carouse. Consequently, there was a lot of violent death in early business. A lot of fights, a lot of uh, mine accidents, that sort of thing. So pretty much any building in town that's been around for more than eight, 80 years or so, we figure, has a fairly legitimate claim to past residents that may be hanging around. Now, none of the ghosts I introduce you to tonight on the tour are on our payroll. <laughs> so there's no guarantee that any of them will show up. Although we generally have a oh, 25 or 30 percent hit rate, something like that, where people will uh, hear something or feel something or see something or get a photograph or something. So we always like it when people on the tour do have some sort of an encounter. It makes it more fun for everyone.
To which their reaction was, well, that's just our lady goat, Pearl. Now, Pearl apparently was a traveling companion to an itinerant preacher who worked the Western Mining Circuit. That preacher passed away here in the hotel in the early 20th century. And Pearl went on to her own life, apparently died a few years after that, and returned to the hotel looking for her friend, the preacher. I mentioned Bisbee ghosts are friendly ghosts. Well, Pearl's sort of our, one of our mischievous ghosts. She likes to pull pranks on guests at the hotel. By the way, are any of you staying at the Bisbee Ranch? It's a wonderful hotel. I'll, I'll get to that in a while. I've stayed there. If you happen to be in one of the suites and go out for the afternoon, you may return to your room to find all the chairs piled up on the bed. We think maybe she wants to vacuum. <laughs> Or she might take all the towels in the bathroom and pile them up in the middle of the floor. I've yet to figure out what that was about. <laughs> about three and a half years ago, there were two young ladies on my tour. They were staying in the Oriental Suite upstairs on the right. The mantelpiece in there, and at the time, there were four little ceramic figurines on that mantel. And one of those young ladies, the self-proclaimed neat freak, noticed that one of those figurines was a little out of line. So she very carefully spaced them all evenly, facing straight into the middle of the room. She and her friend came downstairs to the car to get things went back up to the, their uh, suite to discover each one of those figurines was now pointing in a different direction. <laughs> Downstairs in the bar during that remodel in the 80s, they wanted to bring in some class, some history, searched far and wide, finally located the perfect Victorian bath bar. Fortune said had it cleaned up and shipped it all the way from Tombstone. <laughs> Came out of the pony saloon over there. They got it installed and discovered it. Not only did they get a beautiful bath bar, they got Jeremiah. <laughs> now, Jeremiah was a um, gambler.
Christina at the saloon. <laughs> There's no front end. Now, a little over 28 years ago, my wife and I actually spent our wedding night in the Victorian suite. The next morning, she ran a bath in the clawfoot tub, took a chair, set it next to the tub, put two towels on the chair. Came back into the other room to finish getting ready. She went back in to take her bath to find all the towels, including the two she put on that chair, now piled up in the middle of the floor. She blamed me. <laughs> I had to remind her I'd been in the same room with her the whole time. We hadn't heard anything about ghost stories or any of that at the time. It wasn't until I started doing the ghost tour and learned about Pearl that we decided that, well, maybe we had met Pearl that night. We just didn't know it at the time. Everybody get a chance to see this?
came up and told her about the Mitchell family, little Jean Diane. And unlike the previous three occupants, Miss Aviva's reaction was more like, wow, cool. <laughs> so she decided to ask around and see what else she could learn, too, about the history of the building. She met a gentleman who had been a child here in the 60s and knew little Jean Diane. So the one thing he remembered most about her, she never went anywhere without a little rubber bouncy ball. Played with it constantly. So what Miss Aviva did, every night when she closed up the shop, she would hide a little rubber bouncy ball somewhere on a shelf in a corner in a different room. Not always, but frequently the next morning, she would come in to find that ball relocated to a different shelf or a different corner. So it seems that uh, little Jean Diane and uh, Miss Aviva had reached an understanding, at least, if not actually a friendship. Now, about a month ago, Aviva was doing so well here, she needed more room, so she moved across the street to that spot that's like four times the size of the show. So now we're waiting to uh, see who gets to move in here next. <laughs> All right, we're going to carefully uh, cross the street, gather on the other side where I have yet another photograph to show. Uh, uh, uh.
stop here, not because this is haunted, but as we know it is not. It's a private home. About 19 years ago, the owners had this gate and the one at the top of the stairs commissioned by a local artist. At the time, he proposed, in order to visually balance this bottom gate, provide a couple of small statues of ladies with wings. Well, while he was designing them, 9-11 occurred. So he redesigned them as archangels. Part of one on the left is grounding to comfort those left behind. The one on the right is ascending to go with those who perished. And this has become somewhat of an icon of Bisbee and uh, one of the most frequently photographed places in town. Personally, I think the dead end sign adds a certain something <laughs> to the photograph. <laughs>
John said when he heard the shouts, he jumped up and ran for the door. When he heard the shots, he turned around to go put his clothes on first. He came back, opened the door to find Nat laying in a pool of blood at the top of the stairs. One of the other residents of the house, uh, K. Rock, said he too had heard the shouts and shot, grabbed his pistol out of the tight shirt and was jumped running up the hallway. Well, they woke everybody. Law enforcement came, interviewed everybody in the house. The stories were all very similar. Shouts and shots. Some people thought they might have heard people leaving the building, but they weren't sure because the hallways were in the Hey, Ross told the police that he thought it was a burglar because he said he'd found his wallet inside the door of his room. Empty. A few days later, he reported that his gold watch had also gone missing. Police kind of discounted that as a uh, motive for the crime simply because if he was a burglar, why did he cut loudly and <coughs> shoot and draw attention to himself? Well, like I said, he was very popular in town. Over $800 in rewards offered. The investigation went on for many weeks, but no one was ever charged with the death of Matt Anderson. Now, we have since gone back through all those documents, done some more research, and we think we figured out who shot Matt Anderson and why they did. Hey, Ross, the guy who was out in the hallway with his pistol. Well, as we're going documents, we noticed something. The police never mentioned checking that pistol he had in his hand to see if it had been fired. So we looked a little deeper and found out that uh, when he came, had come into town, he was married, had a young wife, a little girl. He'd lost both of them to disease. In despair, he'd taken a drink, lost his house, how he ended up living at the Alamo house. And it seems that he um, was a bit jealous of Matt Anderson's status in the community that he was drunk that night when uh, Matt came up the stairs in a drunken stupor and a rage and shot Matt Anderson. Can't prove it. Not this many years later, but that's our case. Now, as it happens, it's uh, my coincidence. <laughs> I have a copy of Matt Anderson's death certificate. <coughs> you look in the left-hand column here about halfway down. It says, cause of death, gunshot wound, pistol in forehead. Before you pass that on, if you turn it over, on the back there's a photograph of a mirror. It opened in 1907. It's one of the earliest churches in the state of Arizona. The reason I mention it, I had mentioned earlier there weren't many children in early history. The city wanted to change. They wanted more families to come to town. Their solution was they hired recruiters to go across America and as far away as Europe to recruit religious leaders to come and establish congregations and business. They were so successful with that program that today, in the various districts of Bisbee, even though the population is now somewhere under 5,400, you can find a house of worship for just about every denomination one might think of. And just because it's Bisbee, there's maybe two or three you may not have heard of before. <laughs> <laughs> the building straight behind me, the red brick the white frame is the Bisbee Y-W-C-A. It opened in 1916, and at the time it was only the second white first one was in New York City. Bisbee was a big deal city. Today it is still an active line. The top three floors are uh, low-income housing for both women and men because that red brick building with a white trim over there used to be the YMCA. Today it's the gym club suites. It's a bed and breakfast. <laughs>
administration. The second word is the one most people hear. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs>
last day, she can describe it in detail. Because she's a joke. She's too funny. Everybody get a chance to see the picture? Okay. Gotta go up that way. you get the short version <laughs> of the old news. Ghost Comedy Show! <laughs> <laughs> Where's the ghost's favorite place in the entire world to go on vacation? The Dead Sea? <laughs> now there are ghosts here in North America that don't want to travel overseas on vacation, but they still want that gochi, gochi, Ghosty beachy experience. Many of them end up going to Lake Erie. Uh. <laughs> Grown to her <laughs> Did you hear about the teenage ghost? Never leaves his room. He doesn't do anything but play video games. His friends only exist on Snapchat and Facebook. <laughs> he needs to get a life. <laughs> the guy moving into town here today put his entire life savings down on a down payment on a house. Start getting moved in, got the kitchen all set up, got the bedroom all set up, church set up, the living room goes back in the kitchen, everything's out of the shelf, on the floor, goes into the bedroom, all the furniture's up against one wall. No idea what's going on. Calls his buddy who's lived here all his life. I I don't understand. I I can't figure this out. Is there like earthquakes here or something? I, what's going on? finally made me go to the doctor today, and it seems that it's all my fault.
Oh, there's the article of the lady in the white. Rachel, you're live Hello. on this one. Having lots of fun. There's the Arizona. Yeah. Uh, ghost tour. BisbeeGhostTour.com. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, close enough.
door since the day of. They're older hotels, technically, but every one of them gets, during some time in their history, closed for remodeling or bankruptcy or fire or turned into the condos or whatever. This one never happened. This was built by the mining company to be the premier hotel in town. You attract high-end guests, politicians, high-end entertainers, major investors in the mine, much like Judge DeWitt Bisbee, who in the city's name and who, strangely enough, never set foot in town. You think of the entertainment city after you stop by and say, how do you make it? Thank you. 
corner room room as well, 2315 on the third floor. And it's adjacent to one of the rear entrances to the hotel, so her clients can come and go in relative anonymity. And like many in her profession, she had a dream that one day one of her clients would fall in love with her, would marry her, and take her away. It did not work out the way Julie did. Instead, she fell in love with one of her clients, could no longer contain her feelings for him, professed her undying love, and he spurned her. How can you imagine a standing member of this community like myself? Heard these many years to my faithful wife and leave her to marry prostitute. Don't ever speak to me again, Jack. I don't ever want to see you again. Stay out of my sight. So completely heartbroken was Miss Julie. She returned here to the hotel. In the hallway, immediately outside her room, committed suicide by hanging. She is sometimes seen on this staircase, dressed in lingerie, carrying a large black box. Guaranteed, spirits will appear. 